And welcome to Inverness Christian Fellowship. We're delighted this morning that you've been able to connect with us on all the different social media platforms that are available. We just want to give you a special welcome this morning. We have a few people taking part as usual. We're delighted that Paul Howells, our National Apostle, will be um, sharing a little bit later on. Anne will be praying and Lee will be reading from God's Word just before we go into a time of worship. Indeed, so let's just come before the Lord and bring all these things to him in prayer. Father, we just want to thank you for your goodness. We want to thank you for your faithfulness. Father, thank you for this uh, ability to be able to connect in this way. Father, even though we are in different homes, Father, we thank you that you unite us by your Spirit. Father, thank you for Jesus, the one who does unite us and bring us into that fellowship with you and with one another. Father, we just pray that in everything that takes place today, Father, that you would receive all the praise and all the glory. And Father, as we lift our voices to you in singing songs of praise, Father, I pray that you would inhabit our praises. And Lord, that you would fill each home with your presence. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So just before we go into a time of singing praise, Lee is going to read for us. Thank you, Lee. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength, seek his face always. Praise the hallelujah. 
presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I'll raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. And I hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive I'll raise a hallelujah With everything inside of me Praise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I'll raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I'll raise a hallelujah. Fear you lost your hold on me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm Louder and louder And I hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise That is defeated The King is alive I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm Louder and louder I hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise That is defeated The King is alive Sing a little louder In the presence of my enemies Sing a little louder Louder than the unbelief Sing a little louder No weapon is melody, sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me, sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies, sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief, sing a little louder. My weapon is melody, sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me, sing a little louder. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder. Gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. That is defeated. The king is alive. Of the storm, louder and louder. Gotta hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. That is defeated. The king is alive. The king is alive. The king is alive. The king is alive. Amazing grace.
Let's pray. Father, we just come together today to praise and glorify your name. You are our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Lord, we just love you. We thank you for the many ways you bless us each and every day. We thank you, Lord, that you love us. We thank you, Lord, that you forgive us and help us to forgive others. Fill us, we pray, with your love towards others. And Lord, we just pray for our country. We pray for those in government, for your wisdom. And forgive us, Lord, for the many sins. We pray, Lord, for our queen and family, especially at this sad time in their lives. And Lord, we pray for each other. We pray, Lord, you would heal the sick, Lord. And we pray that you would give your people complete knowledge of your will, that you would give us spiritual wisdom and understanding. We pray that the way we live would always honour and please you. We pray that our lives would produce every kind of good fruit. And we pray that we would grow as we learn and know you more and more. We pray, Lord, that we would be strengthened with all your glorious power so that we would all have all the endurance and patience that we need. And Lord, no matter what our circumstances, and Lord, some people's circumstances are so much worse than we can ever comprehend, we do pray that you would fill us with your joy. Because Lord, your joy is our strength. 
Help us, Lord, to be always filled with praise and thankfulness. Because, Lord, you have redeemed us, you have rescued us, you have saved us, you have forgiven us. We thank you, Lord, for each person joining with us today in our time of worship. And Father, we pray for Paul as he brings us your word. We pray your blessing upon him and his family. We thank you and we pray for Robbie and Karen and ICF leadership as they lead us. And Lord, we just pray all in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who is interceding for us. Amen. Hi, good morning everyone at ICF. It's lovely to be with you. Thank you, Pastor Robbie, for the invite to join with you today. Uh, I trust you're all safe and well and uh, looking forward to a more relaxed and unrestricted summer. And, uh, and I'm sure there are better days ahead of us. Um, so it's lovely to be with you. And as we think about uh, reopening and uh, church functioning in a post-pandemic world, um, I'd like us this morning to think about a little phrase that will hopefully ignite something in us and stimulate us to believe God for, for a great future that's ahead of us. And, uh, but before I give you the, the title, before I give you the, the topic, um, let me read a verse to you. I found a, a smashing couple of verses, actually, in the book of Job, chapter 5. Job, chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. And uh, reading from the Message Bible, because I think it, it, uh, it brings it out even more. And uh, so the, the, the verses are these. After all, God is famous for great and unexpected acts. God does great and unsearchable, marvellous things without number. There's no end to his surprises. What a smashing little verse, or two verses, that is, tucked away in the book of Job. And, uh, and, and as I said, I've read it from the Message Bible. So, what am I coming, where am I coming from this morning? Expect the unexpected. That's the title for my little talk, my little message to you today, expect the unexpected. Let me start off by telling you a true story of a couple that I, um, Christine and I have known for a long time in living in a small mining village in, in South Wales. The couple, the couple are called Emrys and Glenys. Uh, they're not exactly your Gavin and Stacey of this world, but Emrys and Glenys are a smashing little couple. They live in a small terraced house in a South Wales village. They've lived there for over 52 years. My wife and I went to their golden wedding back in 2019. And uh, so they've lived there for over 52 years. From the time they were married, Emrys works in a local factory or used to work before he retired. And um, he would walk to work every day and walk home and uh, probably had the same sandwiches for lunch every day and all the rest of it. He went to the pub twice a week. He went on a Friday night and a Sunday lunchtime. Very much a creature of habit. Glenis worked in the local primary school for 25 years uh, before she retired and uh, they would, they would do their weekly shopping in the local co-op, in the local convenience store. It was just at the end of their, their street. So they would stay local when it came to, to shopping. If they needed new clothes, then they would dare to venture five mile from where they lived to some bigger shops and some greater ranges. And... Uh, uh, and so everything centred around where they were. They'd always been in that space, in that same place. And, um, and, and uh, they were very content with that. Um, twice a year, I guess, they would jump on a train and travel into Cardiff, uh, which is about 30 minutes away. And, um, but that was a big day out for them. That was a big adventure. 
And so they had a very parochial mentality, a very small-minded mentality. They didn't look for anything different. They had a settled routine. Uh, their perspective was very much on where they were and, and didn't think about much outside of that. It was very much the same old, same old, the same cycle every week. They had one daughter whose name was Jennifer. And uh, in 2017, Jennifer came to see them one day and she said, I want to share some good news with you. And uh, Jennifer had won a substantial sum of money on the National Lottery. And uh, so she came to share their good news, her good news with mum and dad. And, um, and she told them what her bucket list was, what she wanted to do with, with the money. And included in that, was to buy mum and dad a brand new semi-detached house. They had lived in this small terraced house, just like two up and two down, very primitive. And uh, Jennifer felt, I want to honour my mum and dad. I want to, I want to buy them a house. I want them to have a bigger garden and a garage and, and, and other facilities that they've been denied over the years. And... Uh, it didn't take them very long to come to a decision because they declined the offer. They could not see themselves living anywhere else. They declined Jennifer's kind offer. They thanked her, and uh, but they turned it down and said, no, this is where we've always been and this is where we'll always stay. And uh, no, why am I saying that? Because I think that true story serves as an illustration of where some churches are at. It serves as an illustration of where some Christians are at in their individual journey with God, who have just are content to stay where they are, do the same thing, uh, not look to push back any boundaries, not look to do anything new than what they've done before. They pray, some Christians pray the same way that they've prayed for for 30 years or more, the same platitudes, they have the same, they have the same entrenched view about the world and, 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 and everything else. There's, there's nothing, nothing new or evolving with them. And churches, are, similarly, some churches have an entrenched position. We've always done it this way. We will always continue to do it this way. There is no moving in progressive revelation or fresh understanding of what God is doing in, in today's world. And uh, so the illustration of Emrys and Glenys is a fitting one, I think, for some churches. Probably not ICF, but for some churches and uh, who are going through the same routines, the same cycle, week in, week out. Uh, the they, uh, spiritual aspirations don't rise very high and uh, they, they're quite happy with the safe and the predictable. And, uh, you know, sometimes even for, for Christians and for churches, being part of a, of, of a denomination with traditions and history, that can play its part in suppressing fresh aspirations new desires to do to do to, to see other things than we've seen before sometimes our history our tradition maybe teaching that's been placed upon us from in in, in re previous years sometimes all that can affect us and we have lost the appetite to rise and do something different we've lost the desire to move into a new space in god because we're very settled where we are. Expect the unexpected. You know the story, of course, of the, the elephant that was tied up at the back of the circus tent. Uh, this massive, huge elephant just tied up to this little rope uh, on a stake in the ground. And people would come and go and pass the elephant and would pass comment as to how flimsy the rope was uh, and how insecure was the post. Uh, and at any time, this huge animal of strength could pull away and the, the, the post would come out of the ground and, and uh, the elephant would be free. 
And one day a person that was visiting the circus saw the elephant trainer and asked the elephant trainer, why would the elephant stay in the same place all the time? Surely it's got the strength to pull away. Don't you need a cage? Don't you need chains? Don't you need something far stronger than just a little rope? And uh, the elephant trainer, their answer to the, to the question was, well, from when the elephant was a baby, the elephant would be tied up in this way. The elephant would, be, would have a rope around him and, and tied to a post. And as the elephant grew in size, he was conditioned to think that he'd always be tied up, that he could not move from that space. And so the elephant grew in size, uh, but, but, the, but the mentality was that he couldn't move, uh, that he was conditioned to believe that he could not break away. He could not try to, 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 to move to somewhere different. And sometimes, you know, we are held by things of the past. We are held by traditions. We are held by, by history. We are held by what people have told us is right uh, all the time we're growing in God we're growing up into Jesus but we are still held to the past and we can't break into the new future that God is ahead of us because of those things in the past we've convinced ourselves that there are some things that we can't do we've convinced ourselves of that I've sat with leaders over many years and they've they've talked about stuff and you'd think who told you that you know, when, you're, when the, your child comes home from school and they say something, any parent would sit them down and say, and who told you that? And I found myself sitting with some leaders on times and saying, who taught you that? Who told you that? Because they headed a glass ceiling. They, they, they'd risen as far as they could. They, they, there was no desire to break into new ground and, because they were, they were conditioned in a certain way, in the way they prayed, in the way they had the philosophy of church, their understanding of ministry, their view of the world, and all these things contributed to just keeping them in the same small little parochial place that they'd always lived in, spiritually speaking. Expect the unexpected. You know, we miss out on things so much because we have this, we have been stifled in our thinking and in our appetite for, for greater things. Uh, you know, during, uh, during lockdown, I've, uh, I've had the opportunity to read some books, perhaps that I wanted to read for a while, and it was just some leisure reading on times, and, and uh, but I read a book by George Muller, and, um, you know, that was, that was a a fantastic, inspiring book on prayer and, and the way George Muller and his wife set the orphanages up and sometimes they'd go to bed in the night and they'd have, they'd have no provision for the next morning. They'd have, they'd, have, they'd have nothing in the cupboard for breakfast for all those young children. And they would pray for 90 minutes before going into bed. They would pray. And when they got up at 5 a.m. the next morning, food, there was food parcels, there was food deliveries, they don't often know where it came from on the doorstep. Amazing book, George Muller. I read, I read the journals of Evan Roberts, who was involved in the Welsh revival, and how God used him to win coal miners, even down in the, sh in, 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 in the earth, down underground, where he, he, shared, he shared the light of Jesus in the darkness of the earth, and, 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 and amazing things, and prepared people for what was coming there. And I also read another book by William Carey. William Carey, of course, was the, the founder of the, the Baptist missionary movement. And he went to India. In, uh, he went to India and he was there for 41 years and uh, never came home. And he wrote something in one of his books, which it's a, it's a little phrase that uh, many a preacher, many a leader, they may have got the plaque in their study or they may have got it on their desk uh, uh, because it's inspirational and it's this you probably would have heard it William Carey wrote attempt great things for God and expect great things from God attempt great things for God expect great things 
from God. Uh, how powerful is that? To go beyond our borders, to go where we've never gone before, to throw off the conditioning and to learn to, to look to explore something new in God uh, and to expect the unexpected. You know, we should never try and figure out God. It's a waste of time to try and second guess God. We have our preferences, we have our rationale, we have our, 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 our expectations and sometimes they're not very high and they become the standard to which God must submit to, or else we reject it. How sad is that when God is wanting to do something and we don't recognise it, we don't identify it. Uh, you know, for you think of the children of Israel, it was a, a huge shift for them coming out of Egypt where there were gods everywhere. They had, they had gods of wood and stone and metal and everything else all around the place. And uh, they lived with that for a number of years. And then God brings them out from that and they're on an unknown path through the wilderness. But they're connecting with the living God. They are connecting with the God of heaven and earth who did things differently, who did supernatural things, who broke out in ways that blew their minds very often. They come to the Red Sea and God opens it up. They're hungry, so manna falls from heaven. There's water gushing from a rock. Amazing things are happening because now they're connecting with a God, with the God of heaven and earth. And uh, it was a whole new ball game for them altogether. Think of the disciples of Jesus. You know, I don't know about you, when how you feel on a Monday morning going to your workplace. And you might feel, oh, same old, same old, another week, it's the same pattern. It's all predictable. Will you imagine being a disciple of Jesus for three years, getting out of bed on a Monday morning or any morning for that and thinking, I can't wait for today. I'm going to work with the Son of God. I'm going to be walking with the Son of God. I'm going fishing with the Son of God. I'm going to a funeral with Jesus. I'm going to a leper colony with Jesus. They were expecting the unexpected. It didn't start out this way, but they had such an appetite having been with Jesus that they began to expect the, the unexpected and I pray that God will instill that in us, that we'll expect the unexpected. God is full of surprises. You know, so often we lean into our limited, preconceived ideas of what church should be like and what should happen in church and, and the function of church and, and, and all the rest of it. We become accustomed to some things happening and certain things not happening. If we're honest, our need of control very often is, is evident. You know, when I pastored in Scotland, in the west of Scotland, I was there for nine years in the 1990s and, uh, and loved it. And uh, one of the churches under my uh, control was um, Greenock. And uh, it was the time when I was there that we had what was called the Toronto Blessing. It was this global manifestation of the Spirit of God that was moving across the planet. And, um, and uh, we sampled some of it in Greenock. And when it first hit us, uh, some people came on a Sunday morning and, and uh, you, you know, they, they were acting very differently to where they normally acted. They would, they would, they would stand and they would, they would laugh and they would fall to their knees and... And there was all these kinds of manifestations were a little bit different to what they were, how they would normally behave in church. And uh, I remember going, sitting with the elders, we had about, I think we must have had four meetings in a fortnight because there was concern that what's come into the church, this is very different. You know, this is, this is breaking out into something that we can't control anymore and and, uh, and these people that, you know, were, were, were just almost, with, without being unkind, but they were stereotypical Pentecostal or apostolics. You know, they came, they sat, they, 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 they were dignified. And, uh, but suddenly, all that's thrown off. And they were bringing their friends. They were bringing their friends to church. And, and uh, you know, the way they would pray and 
that the way they would respond to ministry, it just wasn't them. And, um, but we wanted to control it. And because it was different, we were frightened of it. And I have to say, during that move of God, I saw the good, the bad and the ugly side of things. There were things that we brought correction to. There were things that we utterly rejected. But there were some things that was good. That were good. We saw people fall in love with Jesus all over again. I saw people that perhaps you wouldn't normally see them as emotional in church or as as liberated as they were. But the Spirit of God had got hold of them. And, and I remember sitting with the elders and saying, we've got to make space. You know, we've got, we've got a, a house that's, that's where some people just have, are untouched by it and other people that have come into something fresh and different. And we've got to try and accommodate all that God wants to do. You see, we can miss out on the blessing of God because it's packaged differently. It's packaged differently to the way we expect it. I don't know if you've ever had a, a Christmas present and a big box has been put in front of you. And, uh, you know, in your mind before you un unwrap it, you're thinking all kinds of things. You're thinking, you know, is this the present I wanted? It's big box. And then when you open it, it's full of tissue paper. And right at the bottom is a little small box. And maybe it's a ring or a bracelet or... Uh, a watch or what have you but the person has tried to um, deceive you and uh, by giving you that big box and initially you're thinking big box but a small present and uh, but you soon come round don't you and uh, sometimes you know God packages things very differently to the way that we we we, we, we would like them and uh, because God you've never done it this way before Therefore, we don't think you should do it now because this is us. This is our space. This is the way that we've always operated. You know, I love the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 43 where God reminds Israel, who, by the way, were in a sense of a state of dis despair at the time. And God reminds them of who he is and, 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 and who they are. And God says, you know, think of what I've done. I've opened the Red Sea. I've annihilated the Egyptians. But listen, don't focus on the past because I'm doing a new thing. Forget all those things. You can list them. You can catalogue them. And they're there. They're historical. But don't lean on them because I'm doing a new thing. And God says to us today in ICF, uh, don't look for me to do it the same way post-lockdown as I did pre-lockdown. Don't look for me to come again and, 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 and express myself the way I did then because this is a day of new things. You know, I wrote a blog earlier this year about uh, the Mo Moses and the, the rock when God told him at the beginning of the journeys to, to strike the rock with the, with the rod and water came out. And 40 years later, God says to him, I'm going to bring water from the rock and I want you to speak to the rock, Moses. It was a different instruction. Initially, it was strike the rock. Now it was, I'm going to, I want you to speak to the rock. And Moses took it on himself that God had probably made a mistake. And so he strikes the rock instead of speaking to it. He made a presumption that God would do it as he'd always done it. It cost Moses an awful lot, of course. It disqualified him from entering the promised land. I trust that we will expect the, the unexpected. We cannot contain God. We cannot put God in a box. You remember the words of Solomon in 1 Kings and chapter 8 when they were dedicated in the temple and he says God cannot be contained. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. It's great that we have a building bricks and mortar but don't think that we can contain God because God breaks out uh, wherever and um, you know sometimes I think that as as Christians we try to we wanted to pin God down we've wanted to regulate God we've wanted to say God you know you show up at this time and you break out in, in, if you're going to break out then you do it during this slot and 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 all the rest of it uh, we should expect the unexpected, I think, especially in a post-pandemic world. There may be challenges that we've never faced before. There might be situations where the church is asked to function 
and, and, and to care and, and to bring ministry into situations that we've never had to before. So I pray that we will be supple and agile and, and ready to respond to what the Spirit of God is saying. There are numerous examples, illustrations in the Bible to people expecting the unexpected or God doing the unexpected. You know, I think of the prophet Elijah. He arrives on the scene. His first assignment is to speak to the king and denounce the judgment and the lifestyle of the king and queen and says, God is going to judge you and there's going to be a drought and a famine for three and a half years. That was, that was his first assignment. Talk about him at the deep end. That's his first assignment. And then God dispatches him to a brook and he lives at the brookside for a, for a time. And remember, there's a drought hmm? and the brook dried up. God, what do I do? I'm on the receiving end of my own prayer. Yeah. I'm on the sharp end of my own prayer. And God fed him by the ravens, you remember. God sent in the ravens, you know, food parcels from above. Ravens normally devour food. But at the instruction of God, they delivered food. And they brought food in and Elijah began to expect every day the, un, the unexpected. Uh, you know, you think of Acts chapter 9 and the conversion of Paul who became the greatest theologian that the church has known. Uh, he was the greatest persecutor, of course, but God changed him and he became its greatest theologian. God wanted, to, God wanted someone to, to spread the gospel into the Gentile world. So who he chooses, somebody who hates the church the most, uh, you know, and takes hold of Saul and becomes Paul the apostle and he becomes a man who just takes the gospel into beyond the barriers of the Jewish world and into, into the Gentile world. Uh, Paul is the patron saint of the unexpected in many ways. God took the Jerusalem church by surprise because the gospel, they thought it was all contained uh, within Jerusalem, of course. And God says, no, I want you to take it. I'm going to, I want you to take it over the wall. I want to take it over the barrier to the Gentiles. So God used a shepherd boy to slay a giant. And he became, he became a great king of Israel you know, his father and his brothers had passed him over. They didn't even call him to the ceremony when the prophet Samuel arrives uh, to anoint a successor to Saul. He wasn't even considered worthy, good enough to be present. He's out on the hillside, send for him, bring him. And when he arrives, Samuel anoints him. Uh, the unexpected. We've just celebrated Easter. Talk about the unexpected. The immovable stone is removed. The unimaginable becomes imaginable. Jesus has been, has, has been raised again from the dead. Uh, the unexpected. Uh, Christmas, the story of Christmas is about the unexpected, about God breaking in into human history. The cross, Good Friday, is a, the unexpected. It was a scandal to some. It was an offence. Uh, but the unexpected happens. Uh, and I pray that God will give us stories in a post-pandemic world where we'll be able to testify about God did the unexpected. God saved people that you never thought he would. God restored prodigals that you thought, I've written them off, if I'm honest. Uh, God turned situations around. Uh, God, God networked you with people that you never thought possible. God, do the unexpected. You know, in Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians, there are two great prayers. There's one in chapter one and there's one in chapter three. And the one in chapter three ends with what we call a doxology. And, uh, and it's a familiar doxology. I'll quote it to you in a moment. And in that prayer that's leading up to that doxology, Paul is, is talking about seemingly impossible things. He's saying... I pray that we will do what we haven't been able to do. I pray that we'll be able to see what we can't see. I pray that we can know what we have not been able to know. And then it's as if the people are saying, hey, come on, that's a tall order. He ends it this way. Now unto him 
who is able to do immeasurably more than we can even ask or think or imagine. And to him be glory in the church. Paul is saying, you think these things are impossible? You think these things are beyond you? Well, let me tell you, when you're connected to God and you have a relationship with God, then don't look at what is impossible, but look at what is possible. And God can do the unexpected. Are we willing to go beyond where we've never been before? Are we willing to go beyond the fence and the boundaries that maybe the denomination has set up or you and your own thinking you've put you've erected a fence around your own life are you able to go beyond that what's your view of God how big is your view of God you know I, I listened to a podcast the other week and the person says that it was a challenge really and he cited Isaiah chapter 40 which is one of the great fantastic chapters of the Bible as you know and and um, the, the the leader that was talking on the podcast said that and if you were to read Isaiah 40 for 30 days consecutively, he says, I guarantee you that you'll have a different view of God altogether. Your praying will be different. Your faith levels will rise. Your understanding of God's greatness and God's purpose in the world will be very different. And so the challenge is to read Isaiah 40 for 30 days consecutively. You know, there are amazing phrases in that chapter, the everlasting God, uh, the God that sits on the circle of the earth and, and all that. You know the chapter very well. Uh, I pray that the COVID-19 lockdown has not diminished your expectations. I pr trust that you haven't lost an appetite for God to do more. I trust that you'll come back when we come back to, to, to in-person church again, that you'll come back with a big appetite uh, and your expectancy will, 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 will rise again to expect the unexpected. Uh, you know, there's nothing that God uh, cannot do. Nothing at all that God cannot do. But we have to position ourselves to be saying, God, we believe it. You know, before lockdown, then I was at one of the local schools. I did their assembly. And, and it was uh, early part of January of last year. And um, before I did my talk, one of the senior teachers in the school was doing a little sketch and uh, with the whole school and with some parents present. And, uh, and she had two children from year five and uh, one on the one on the left and one on the right, and the little boy on the right had a had a little banner that he held up, uh, and uh, the words are when he turned it round, the words were, "But what if I fail?" And the teacher talked about, you know, how we want to break out of that mentality. Don't think that we're going to fail all the time. And she talked about maybe you know thing words that have been said over them and you'll never amount to anything and she talked from history about some people who rose to great things but their childhood they were suppressed and and she talked about you know breaking free of that mentality of failure and then she crossed the assembly and on the other side on the right hand side was a little girl and she turned her banner around remember the little boy's banner was but what if i fail the little girl's banner said, but what if I fly? And she talked about them having aspirations. She talked to those children, young primary school children, seven, eight, nine, ten years of age. She said, but what if I fly? What if I, I can make the best of my life? I want to be an achiever. I want to achieve things perhaps my, my, my parents or my grandparents didn't achieve, but you can do it. And when I thought that, I felt God speaking to me and saying, sometimes, you know, we're afraid of failure in church. We're afraid as leaders to, to invest in a ministry or to push something further or, 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 or to make some faith declarations because we might look silly in front of the people or we might let people down and our reputation is tarnished. But what if I fly here? What if we see that in this new world, there's an opportunity for the church, perhaps that we haven't had before. There's a space that's been created where perhaps uh, 
Other agencies will be looking for the church to put its best foot forward and step in and provide a ministry. Is there any limit to God's power? Certainly not. God asks the question in Jeremiah, is there anything too hard for me? Not at all. God is bigger than any prayer item you put on an agenda. God is bigger than any prayer matter, however sensitive it is, however meaningful to you it is. God is much bigger than that. And I pray that in this day of uncertainty, these are uncertain times, uh, that the church will not revert back to familiarity. The church will not just revert back to a safe, reliable routine, uh, that we will not just look for the familiar once again and say, well, that's what we're comfortable with. The Emrys and Glenys mentality. We've always done it this way. This is the way we've always operated. And uh, we're having low expectations, perhaps, and our faith levels are reducing rather than rising. Or we reset our expectations. We reset our dreams. We see that God cannot be tied down by the traditions of men and the rules of men. And we reset the faith levels. We reset the prayer agenda. And we go again. And we believe that God is going to do. And we expect the unexpected. You know, Israel failed in the wilderness in that they limited God. Hebrews tells us that. The Psalms tell us that. That they limited God. In spite of all that they saw. The miraculous opening of the Red Sea. The manna. The water from the rock. The cloud. The pillar by fire. And so on. You know they provoked God. They tested the patience of God. And in Psalm 78 we're told that they limited the Holy One of Israel. And I pray that we will throw off any shackles, any mindsets that we've brought with us to this point. Let God challenge your mindset today. Lord, enlarge the place of my tent. Enlarge my thought patterns. Enlarge my heart, God. Enlarge my faith capacity because I want to expect uh, the unexpected. God, I want you to surprise me. God, I want to be, I want to live an adventure It's more than just church attendance. It's an adventure that I'm on with God. And God, I want you to come through at every possible moment. And Lord, I'm willing to believe. I'm willing to move into a new space. I'm willing to throw off the old and embrace the new. ICF, expect the unexpected. The Lord bless you.
Well, thank you very much indeed, thank Paul. What a great message. Expect the unexpected. Mm -hmm. And all through that message, you were building our faith to expect the unexpected. And we are believing that God is the one that is able to do impossible things. And we've been talking about that, you know, a little bit um, over the last few weeks. So it's great. And what a great message as we go into four days of praying and fasting for our children and young people to expect the unexpected. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you mm. so much, Paul. And as we come into this week, then our life groups will still be meeting, but not the same as usual. There'll be no uh, study questions going out. But each life group will be open this week for for an hour of prayer and we just encourage as many to, mm. as possible just to dip in it doesn't matter if it's a different day to the one you normally go to and um, dip in if you can even if it's only for half an hour um, just so that we can pray together for our young folk our children our young folk our youth fellowship our youth group and those who are away studying at university as well so that we can bring those um, to the Lord in prayer. Yeah, and if you're not part of a Connect Life group, you are more than welcome mm. to come and join any of these um, times together just to uh, connect and pray and bring all these precious ones before uh, our Father. Yeah, so um, mm. if you're part of our mailing list, you'll um, have already had information about this and um, all our Zoom details will be on that. If you don't know our mm -hmm. Zoom details but would like to get involved, please yes. email us. Our email address is on the screen now mm -hmm. and we can point you in the right direction. Absolutely. So this afternoon, they, in line with a, a lot of other uh, places around the nation, there is a service to following the funeral of uh, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip. And that will be live streamed from Nest Bank Church at three o'clock. And again, the details of that are on the screen below. Yeah. So Robbie, next week you are sharing again, yep. going back to um, they devoted themselves to the breaking of mm -hmm. bread. Looking forward so to that. yeah, we're looking forward mm -hmm. to that. Um, and uh, also then this, um, this week as we're kind of praying and fasting for the children and folk, let's mm -hmm. remember and pre prepare our hearts ready yeah. for that message on Indeed. Sunday. Indeed. We're going to have some fellowship now um, over Zoom as we um, share together, um, enjoy a cup of tea mm -hmm. and uh, go into breakout rooms and just share in mm -hmm. smaller groups yeah. and encourage one another and let's talk about that message that we've just heard from yeah. Paul um, and let's share about it. Let's build each other's faith, let's build Absolutely. each other up, one another yeah. up. So at this point we would normally share the benediction but we have the privilege this morning of uh, Alicia uh, leading us in the Lord's Prayer. Thank you, Alicia. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our de debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen.